Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. Uh, so we were discussing uh, about Ethereum blockchain and uh, to start the discussion on Ethereum, we need to talk a little bit about uh, why we use blockchain. And you will see throughout the course that uh, whenever we say why we, uh, we want to use blockchain, depending on which context we are talking about, which platform we are talking about, we'll talk, it, talk about it slightly differently. So let's look at this in the Ethereum context. So earlier we said that, uh, you know, in the Bitcoin, we said that it's about uh, uh, you know, generating cryptocurrency and then making transactions of cryptocurrencies, uh, uh, you know, uh, double uh, spending proof and, and all that. Now we are saying that blockchains are to be used when multiple parties, perhaps located across the world, need to share data and transfer value without trusting each other. Now we are bringing in data sharing as one of the key reasons why we want to use blockchain and transfer of value, which may mean transfer of properties, assets, or which could mean transfer of coins or cryptocurrencies, right? So this is more generic than what Bitcoin was doing. Now let's look at this trust issue. So we are saying that even if we don't trust uh, each other, the different parties, we can still make sure that we can securely and uh, uh, we can uh, generate a trust that everything will be working fine without a third party ensuring that everybody is playing fair, right? So usually we need a third party. Now this trust about the different parties in a transaction, and when I say transaction here, I, I don't mean cryptocurrency transaction, any world, real world transaction like buying a property or, or sharing information and all that. So there is a, uh, what the financial world calls this kind of mistrust is counterparty risk. Counterparty risk means that the, uh, the thought that, or the risk that the other party won't hold up their end of the bargain, right? So, for example, I want to uh, want to purchase a book from you, and I send you money, but you don't send me the book, right? How do I ensure that that doesn't happen? Now, currently, the way it works is that the other party, which is selling the book, is uh, normally a large company like Amazon, and therefore they have other reputation to keep because tied to their reputation is their uh, value of the company. Now, if it is a small time person like Amazon Marketplace, then it is Amazon who underwrites the risk, right? So, but in, in all these cases, uh, 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 the counterparty risk is mitigated by either reputational issues or by a third party. So, <clears throat> the blockchains uh, such as Ethereum tries to remove the counterparty risk through a clever use of mathematics, cryptography, and peer-to-peer -peer networking, right? So that's what the blockchain platform provides is the remediation of the counterparty risk without a third party uh, or centralized authority. So let's see what's wrong with the centralized approach. And we discussed this before. Let's say the central database is uh, uh, your uh, student grade database uh, in a university and uh, all the grades submitted by the instructors are in the database and the way to interact with the database is through a front end uh, like a uh, through a browser uh, and then the front end is uh, actually rendered version of html uh, css javascript etc and then in the back end there are some server program server uh, application like uh, written in php ruby Python and so on, and then there is database. Now, the point is that how does the student know that the data in the database about his grades or her grades is the correct grade that the instructor provided? How does the instructor know that the grade they submitted is in the long term 
remains the same grade after some years. Could be that somebody insider could have changed the database or it could be that there was a cyber attack on the web server and through that they gained access to the website, maybe through SQL injection. And also the when you back up and restore the database, depending on how you keep your backup and uh, who has access to the backup and so on, uh, the database backup, uh, when you reconstruct the database from the backup, you may not be able to uh, trust it. And this is the problem with a centralized approach. So one possibility is that every time the data changes, you make a backup copy and you retain all historical backups of the data. And you keep the hash of the backup and keep the hash safe to prove the in proof integrity violation. But the question is where do you keep the hash of the data? Because if the person uh, who is in charge of the database hashes the backup and keeps the hash with him, then later on if he decides to go and change the data, he will change the hash also. So the hash should be somewhere that he or she cannot manipulate, right? So one possibility is that you don't put all the data in your database uh, in, in, in a blockchain, but you commit the hashes of the different backups to the blockchain. So every time you want to go and check integrity, you have to look the hash up in the blockchain. And given that blockchain is tamper resistant, that the person who is in charge of the database may not still be able to uh, the access the hash and change it. If he changes the data and he cannot change the hash. So that's uh, one possible way of mitigating uh, this risk of a central authority keeping the data. Now, the, when you share data, all stakeholders has to agree that the data is not tampered with and maybe some proof mechanism might be required, maybe uh, again some hash kind of thing is required to prove that the data integrity uh, is maintained. So usually what we uh, normally do in today's IT world is that uh, uh, we, ha we cert get certified by a third party auditors. And this IT system auditors come and check and say that, okay, uh, I have checked all the logs and everything and nothing has uh, been tampered with and so on. I certify, then whoever is interested can actually look up the, uh, the audit reports and, and uh, satisfy themselves. But this has uh, uh, all kinds of problems because the auditors might be bribed, the auditors might make mistakes, all kinds of problems. So I as a consumer of the data or whose data is being, uh, being uh, uh, kept at the central server has no way to directly get a proof of integrity. You are always trust, you have to trust the third party auditor or, uh, or you have to trust the party that is keeping the data and that's not very uh, comforting, especially in today's uh, day and age. So one can uh, consider blockchain in different ways. So one possibility is that you keep all the data in the blockchain and uh, every time you commit a data, that's a transaction. Every time you make a change in the data, you make that's a transaction. If every time you delete a data, that's a transaction. So all these things will be in the blockchain. Uh, and since uh, everybody has a copy of the ledger, so it's uh, and and therefore, depending on what consensus mechanism you use, you are unlikely to be able to uh, do anything without being caught by some of the participants. So this makes. Uh, the uh, ledger secure, decentralized and replicated and so on. So it's a fault tolerant and uh, anybody who wants to verify that the data has uh, not been tampered with, all the information about when the data was uh, put, like initiated, that's a transaction. When the data was uh, uh, modified, that's a transaction. When the data was deleted, it was a transaction. So you can actually uh, go go to go and browse the uh, the blockchain it's a public and then you can say that okay you know i have a proof that so i have direct proof not by a third party auditor telling me that i have checked all the logs and everything now one problem with this is that data often is private information like grades 
you cannot put grades of students in a public ledger. So, so in that case, you do not necessarily have to put the actual data in the blockchain, but you put the hash of the data every time you make a transaction on the data, you put a hash of the data in the in the blockchain. So, every time you want to check data integrity, you have to check against the hash that is there in the blockchain. So, so this may not make a whole lot of sense right now, but uh, we will talk about this later when we look at the applications. But the point is that blockchain is not necessarily for keeping all the data on the blockchain. Blockchain could be only about keeping the logs of all transactions in a secured form in the blockchain, so that you have proof that the data has been tampered with or not. You do not necessarily, but in some cases you can, uh, if the data is not necessarily public or you cannot derive private information from the data by seeing the data, then you can actually directly put the data in the blockchain. But again, putting the data in the blockchain will make the blockchain heavy and remember it gets replicated all over the places. So, so you have to find out based on your application needs, whether you want to put all the data in the blockchain or you want to put some clever way of proofs of data tampering or not in the blockchain. Now, what are the concepts that are um, common in blockchain? We have seen there are nodes which do transaction validation, which do block validation, which make blocks uh, through mining or, or some other technique and, and when they make blocks, it could be that they might be solving puzzles or it, they could be part of uh, the authority or they could be having uh, enough stake to be one of the nodes who is making uh, the, uh, the next block or the nodes could be ordinary nodes who are just doing transactions. So, there is concept of transaction, there is concept of blocks and if it is through proof of work, then there is mining involved and this is done through solving hard problems or if you can, you may actually do a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus, uh, we will see uh, other blockchains where that is done instead of mining. Hash is used for integrity, digital signature for authenticity or authorization and there is tamper resistance. So, we know all this uh, just to re, uh, recalling uh, some of the concepts. Now, let us see one application, right. So, let us say Bob has three coins and he wants to send one to Alice and Alice has one coin. So, at the end of this transaction, Alice should get two and Bob should get two, that would be the next state, right. So, the current state is three and one, the next state after the transaction should be two is to two, but this is one of the transactions and here are examples of many transactions. So, when a node that wants to make a block gets uh, enough number of transactions to fill a block, then they will do a mining or some other way of deciding that these are the transactions that I am going to put in the block. I, they, they will actually check validity of the transactions and then they will put the transactions and then put attach it to the last block. So, that is what happens here. So, at the end when the block has been put into the blockchain and depending on what the process is, whichever miner wins, then the state of the uh, situation changes. Now, we have 2 and 2 for Bob and Alice. We know this from before, except that in case of Bitcoin, we do not have a specific thing about Bob and Alice or this account and that account, right. So, now we are talking about account to account transactions, right. So, that is something that is there in Ethereum and which is not in Bitcoin. Okay, so, now we are ready to see what Ethereum is really about. So, first of all, Ethereum allows you to run programs in its trusted environment, right. So, we saw that in the uh, Bitcoin blockchain also, we run scripts, right. So, every time I want to validate a transaction, I look at the input transaction and I look at the output transaction and I collect script uh, from the input transaction, uh, the output part of the output uh, the, uh, script of that previous transaction and the signature of this uh, uh, new transaction, I put them together and I execute a, uh, a script. So, that script execution actually 
ensures that the transaction is valid, right? So here also we have such programs which run every time a transaction has to be carried out. But these programs compared to the Bitcoin blockchain are much more generic program. In fact, the by intentionally Ethereum made their programming language Turing complete. So it can execute any arbitrary function and like Bitcoin which was not uh, Turing complete and therefore we could not uh, run any arbitrary functions he, or write any arbitrary functions in that limited scripting language. We have programming language here which allow you to run a, uh, create any programs for any uh, function and uh, therefore we can run any programs. And these programs run uh, on something called an EVM or Ethereum virtual machine. This Ethereum virtual machine is actually like any processor or Java virtual machine for example, which has a certain model of computation. So when it looks at the different uh, uh, instructions of the program, how it, this instruction is executed is based on the semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine. So, so for example, in, in the Bitcoin scripting language also we saw, remember we, we showed you how the, they have a stack and then and they put the data values on the stack and when they actually get to an opcode, they uh, depending on the opcode, they will retrieve the top one or top two or whatever number of uh, arguments from the, from the stack and then they will execute the opcode and then if there is a uh, there is an output of the opcode then that is now put on the top of the stack so this is how that's what is what is the semantics of the script right and the semantics of the script is dependent on the virtual machine uh, or or the program programming com or com model of computation on which the program runs so ethereum virtual machine is also stack based computational model where there is there is a stack these stacks actually are are 30 two byte uh, uh, words per entry and you can have at most I think 1024 entries in the stack. So the stack can grow up to 1024 and as uh, the uh, opcodes are encountered depending on the opcode you might take uh, the top uh, elements of the stack or the uh, top two elements or top three elements whatever the opcode requires to execute. And then if the execution of the opcode has an output, that output goes on the top of the stack. Now Ethereum also, this, since the stack is limited in size, therefore it, ca it cannot give you a completely Turing uh, complete execution. So therefore it allows uh, access to memory and also uh, it uh, allows access to storage. So therefore, unlike the, so if you have to be Turing complete and those of you who have taken a course in theory of computation know that a Turing machine has an infinite tape, right? And because it has an infinite tape, you know, you can go, uh, you can have arbitrary long intermediate state of the program. So here also there is memory and there is a stack and there is uh, storage, so you can actually do anything you want and your state can go uh, pretty large and then, then again it may go become small, but that is how the Ethereum programs are executed. So Ethereum programs when they get executed, they produce some result and depending on what the program is uh, supposed to do, this uh, uh, program could be putting money from one. Uh, one account to another or it could be launching a new contract or uh, new, uh, new Ethereum program, a smart contract or it could be actually uh, doing some data storage. Uh, so depending on what the uh, program is supposed to do. Now what happens is that, so a transaction is actually in, uh, involves invocation of functions in a smart contract. So smart contract is more like if you know C++ or Java, it is actually a collection of methods and some data, right? So when a transaction needs to happen, it refers to a smart contract, it may refer to a smart contract and some method or function inside the smart contract 
and and it can do that you know a transaction can can be quite complex so it can actually do multiple different uh, uh, calls to different uh, functions and in different smart contracts and these uh, have to be executed so when the transaction has to be validated every node that is validating the transaction will also execute the entire code right so every node that is validating a transaction will actually run code on their EVM. And uh, this programs therefore have to be what we call deterministic programs. So a deterministic program is a program that uh, no matter how many times you run, they will always produce the same result. Like, unlike a non-deterministic program or a randomized program where different runs may produce different results. So therefore, all the different nodes that is verifying the transaction or, or validating the transaction when they execute, they end up with the same final state uh, and final uh, result. So the code is contained in smart contracts and the state of the EVM is persisted on the blockchain. So every time you execute a smart contract or a transaction, you might change the state of the EVM and that information is put on the blockchain. So it's not just that the transactions are on the blockchain, but the EVM states are on the blockchain. So all nodes process smart contracts to verify the integrity of the contracts and their outputs. So as I said, a smart contract is code that runs on EVM. Most of the smart contracts are written in uh, a language called Solidity. Solidity is an object oriented language uh, kind of like JavaScript. So smart contracts themselves can accept and store Ether, right? So it's not only that a, a person's account on, on Ethereum can store Ether and, and spend Ether, but smart contracts themselves can also accept and store Ether. It can also accept and store data or it can accept and store both data and coins based on what is written in the smart contract, in the code of the smart contract, it can actually also distribute that ether to other accounts, other human accounts or to other smart contracts. So kind of like each smart contract as if they also have an account, right? So humans uh, can create accounts as players. In the account, they can uh, put ether, they can earn ether by, by selling stuff and then somebody sends ether to their account or they can mine ether if, they're, uh, if they have enough computation power and they can put those ethers in their account. Similarly, uh, the smart contracts themselves also can uh, get ether, can uh, spend ether and they can spend, get data and uh, store data, uh, then uh, remove the data and so on. So let us see what kind of transactions are done with smart contract and here you will not see much different from what this smart contract that we are going to show now is very similar to what can be uh, what we have seen before in terms of escrow transactions uh, in case of Bitcoin because this is this does not require a lot of programming uh, uh, primitives. It can actually be done with uh, very simple programming primitives like uh, what is available even in Bitcoin. So let us say Alice wants to hire Bob to build her patio and uh, so but Alice does not want to give the money upfront to Bob because she is afraid that Bob will then do a poor job or not do the job or do worse uh, make her patio even worse. So Alice tells Bob that you deposit some money to an escrow account and I will deposit also money in that same escrow account and an escrow account is basically a contract. So contract which is uh, so in, instead of a person like a Judy like in case of the escrow we, we saw in case of Bitcoin where there was a third party Judy who was uh, uh, you know kind of working as an escrow here a program will work as an escrow. So the program is written in such a way so that if the contract the, the real world uh, contract gets fulfilled for example Bob really builds the patio to Alice's satisfaction then Alice can invoke a function in that contract so as to pay Bob the money and if 
Bob does not do a uh, satisfying job or does not build her patio, then she can uh, invoke, invoke a function in the contract to actually not only get back her money uh, depending on what is written in the contract, maybe get Bob's deposit also. So, that is how the contract. So, here instead of a human third party, we are using a program to enforce the this uh, contract. So, here is and let us say an escrow uh, smart contract and you have uh, both of them put some money in there in this case one ether each and then at the end Alice says uh, sends uh, an ok message to one of the functions that pays up Bob to ethers right. So, one his deposit back and one for what he has earned. So, as I said before the smart contract of ethereum are written in, in solidity and uh, in the next session when we come back we will talk about a little bit on solidity what it is like and so on and I will give you a pointer as to uh, through which you can actually start uh, uh, writing your program uh, smart contracts in solidity in a in a simulation environment. So, that is where we will we'll start in the next class. Uh, in the next session. Okay. <clears throat>